Suicide by Imagination by Thomas Ligotti Read by Jeff Clark To others he always tried to convey the impression that he lived in a better place than he did, one a little more impressive and far less decayed. If they could only see what things are really like here, I would die of shame. Feeling somewhat morose, he closed his eyes and sank down into gloomy reflections. He was sitting in a plump, stuffed chair which was sprouting in several places through the worn upholstery. Would you like to know how it feels to be dead? He imagined a voice asking him. Yes, I would, he imagined answering. A rickety but rather proud-looking gentleman, this is how he imagined the one who spoke to him, led him past the gates of a graveyard. They were flaking with age and squeaking in the wind, just as he always imagined they would. The quaintly tilting headstones, the surrounding grove of vaguely stirring trees, the soft gray sky overhead, the cool air faintly fragrant with decay. Is this how it is? he asked hopefully. Late afternoon in a perpetual autumn? Not exactly, the gentleman answered. Please keep watching. The gentleman's instruction was intended ironically, for there was no longer anything to behold. No headstones, no trees or sky, no fragrance of any kind to be sensed. Is this how it is, then? he asked once more. A body frozen in blackness, a perpetual night in winter? Not precisely, the gentleman replied. Allow your vision to become used to the darkness. Then it began to appear to him, glowing with a glacial illumination, a subterranean phosphorescence. Initially, the radiant corpse he saw seemed to be in a stiffly upright position, but he had no way of calculating his angle of perspective, which may actually have been somewhere directly above the full length of the body, rather than frontally facing its height. No less than its mold-spotted clothes, the flesh of the cadaver was in gauzy tatters, lips shriveled to a powdery smudge on a pale shroud of a face, eyes dried up in the shells of their sockets, hair a mere sprinkling of dust. And now he imagined the feeling of death as one previously beyond his imagination. This feeling was simply that of an eternally prolonged itching sensation. Yes, of course, he thought. What else could it be but an incredible itching when all the fluids are gone and ragged flesh chafes in ragged clothes? How absurd! Is this, then, how it truly feels to be dead? he asked. But this time no voice answered him, or none that he heard. He was past all that now. Never again would he imagine such things as how it felt to be dead and never again would he have to lie to another soul on earth. A long time passed before anyone came to his home and saw his body, its bony fingers digging into the tattered material of a plump, stuffed armchair, its skin already crumbling and covered with the room's dust. He was found by some acquaintances who wondered what had become of him, and as they stood for a few numbed moments around the sight of his seated corpse, a few of them absent-mindedly gave their collared necks or shirt-sleeved arms a little scratch. Along with the trauma this unexpected discovery imposed, there was the lesser shock of the dead man's run-down home, which was not at all like the more impressive residence he had described to them. What a place to live! they thought, and what a place to die, they imagined, each one of them, when, on autumn afternoons or winter nights, they recollected the thing they found in the chair, or simply reflected on the phenomenon of death itself. Occasionally these musings would be accompanied by an itch that was practically impossible to relieve, often ceasing only after they had torn away at their flesh until it bled.